Well, we have to admit that we're surprised by how popular our video in depth of field uh, has become. No idea if people were that interested in the topic. Uh, appreciate your comments and questions. Uh, rather than address those questions individually, um, we're going to parse through them and group them together because some of them overlap and some build on each other. And we'll break them up into the right you know, videos, put them out over the next oh, three or four weeks. One of the questions that came in, uh, a rather fundamental question, is what exactly is an f-stopper? How did we end up with this goofy sequence of numbers? It appears to be illogical. And related to that is why is f-16 uh, smaller than f-4, for example? Well, if you've been in photography very long, you probably memorize this sequence of numbers. Well, unless you, you know, you just leave your camera on automatic and you don't pay attention to any of your camera settings. But if you've been shooting large format or shooting film, you probably memorize this sequence. But chances are, you know, very few people actually know where it came from. Well, we believe the more you, the better you understand how something is working, the better you can apply it, um, whatever the application is. In fact, we're gonna, we can take the, the science and the math behind uh, the whole um, f-stop uh, sequence and apply it to other aspects of our life that some would consider equally as important, and we'll get to that here at the end. Anyway, the f-stop is simply, what we call an f-stop, is simply a dimensionless uh, index that allows you to compare two different lenses. If you have two lenses with the same f-stop, they're going to gather fundamentally basically the same amount of light. And this, the knowledge of this goes way back, hundreds of years ago. They discovered that if you took, a, if you took your basic lens, and we're going to draw our simple lens here. If you took this lens and the focal length, when focused at infinity, and you have the diameter of the lens of the opening, if you divide this out, you get this magic index, and that's where these numbers come from, okay? And any two lenses with the same index are going to basically gather the same amount of light. Well, this was really handy back, you know, like 150 years ago, before you actually had an aperture on your lens. A lot of the early lenses, you had a disc you'd have to pull out and replace it with a disc with the right size hole for the exposure you wanted to make. Well, to calculate that out, what they did is they switched this formula around. And now, if I know I want to shoot at f4, I know the focal length of my lens, I know the diameter of the hole I need in the de disc. Well, this nomenclature um, is what we've been stuck with ever since. And you'll see this on a lot of old lenses, where instead of just saying, you know, f4, it will actually be written f slash 4. And they're, they're giving you the mathematical formula for calculating out the size of the hole you need. And if you take an old me uh, mechanical lens and a caliper and measure it out, you'll see that this applies pretty close. Now, um, it also explains why these numbers appear to be inverted. Why is an f16 setting smaller than, say, an f8? Well, you can see down here, if the, the uh, denominator in the equation gets larger, sorry, I accidentally slipped into math there, but you'll, you'll figure it out. Um, if the denominator gets larger, the uh, result of the division gets smaller. Likewise, if this gets smaller, then the output gets larger. So that's why these numbers appear to be inverted. The other part of this question is, how did we end up with this apparently illogical sequence of numbers. Well, the truth is that these numbers are perfectly logical. They're irrational, and I'll get to that in a second, but they're perfectly logical. So if you went into the math, okay, so if you want twice as much light in your lens, you need an opening that's twice as big. Not twice in diameter, but has to have the area that's twice as big. Well, now you need to know the area of a circle. And you may remember, Area of a circle equals our old favorite pi times the radius squared. Now, I'm not going to dive into deriving all the math here. If you really want to see it, you know, we can publish it somewhere. But basically, if you want to figure out what is the next step, you know, how do I go, how do I get the next circle that's twice as big, and you work through the math, what falls out of it all is the square root of 2. 
And that shouldn't be a big surprise because you know we've got a square factor in here and we're, we're making it twice as big. And so it, it's not a big surprise we ended up with a square root of two, which happens to equal 1.414. Oops, 1.414. Now you look back at this sequence of numbers and they all make sense. Especially if you were if you were able to afford an F1 lens, now you can see that each step is 1.4 times the value in front of it. So, very logical. It's irrational because the square root of 2 goes on forever. Trivial point. Anyway, the other place where this is handy to know, and you can apply this, is if you're trying to decide, do I buy the manager's special two pizzas, you know, two smaller pizzas, or do I just buy one large pizza? Well, you can apply this same factor to your um, pizza purchases. And, for example, if you do, you'll find that two 12-inch pizzas are about the same pizza as one 17-inch pizza. So you can just multiply, and I know it's diameter, not radius, but we're, we're just looking at relative size, not absolute values. So you can multiply the pizza by 1.4, and you'll figure out what would be twice as much, you know, how big of a pizza would be twice as much. So you can optimize, um, you know, your pizza dollars. Anyway, if you have other questions or comments, uh, put them down below. Uh, subscribe to our email and our, our newsletter, and we'll get some other videos out to you, uh, hopefully within the next, uh, you know, two or three weeks.